First of all, thank you for the invitation to join with you. And a special thanks to Fiona for her encouragement, persistence, imagination, and for what I will call her faith, hope, and love. Our life stories are all different. Our experience of our body, the way our brains work, our discoveries and our companions, all different. So also our slow learning to accept the things that we cannot change and finding the courage to say to change the things that we can change and our learning the wisdom to know the difference. Reinhold Niebuhr's old prayer. Our faith journeys are also different. Our language and our imagery are our living within the mystery of things. Our awareness of the presence in daily life of the providential goodness of God. Our sense of the absence of God. Our sense at times of being abandoned by God when we most need God. We live within a wide spectrum of all these things and so much more. My own life story includes an unexpected and unwanted catharsis about 30 years ago caused by the discovery of a developing degenerative disc disease in my spine, necessitating three major spinal operations and the implanting of scaffolding and I'm still learning to live with pain. My faith journey went into meltdown. The understanding of the nature and ways of God, the way of living, what I thought to be a lifelong vocation. And within all this, for nearly 10 years, I was visited visited every six weeks by Gerard Hughes, Jerry Hughes, a Jesuit priest living in a seminary close by in Harborn. He listened and he helped me to listen. And he helped me to discern what was emerging from all the fragments and all the dust and rubble. Much of my life, was and still is lived in this much loved room. A friend once said to me, go to your cell and your cell will teach you. One of the many sayings that I smiled at and walked away from. But through the years, there's been an inner homecoming within everything, more wonder, more joy. There have been what I call new companions. Barney Shorter was an elderly American psychotherapist and a close friend in Notting Hill. Darrell, he said, there will be new companions upon the way. And politely I smiled at Barney because I was lost and scared within those early encounters with isolation and marginalization. But Barney has proved right. There have been rare new companions, the like of which I didn't know existed. Um, I had never met them before. And I'm learning that they are what I call pilgrims inhabiting life's paradoxes, contraction, but expansion, aloneness, yet solidarity, limitation and liberation, physical pain, soul pain, with a profound sense of well-being also, weakness and resilience, blocked bowels and spring composts, independence and interdependence. 
The world of paradox I'm learning is not an either or, but a both and. So who are these new companions that I want to introduce you to? I want to draw you into the life of three quite different little groups and share some of the wisdom that they have drawn me into. Since 1997, a group of priests, women belonging to religious orders, Methodist ministers and some of those who have spouses, sometimes bring their spouses. Some of them living with physical impairments, others with depression, one living in the foothills of dementia. We began to meet four times or four or five times a year in Birmingham. We attempt to be real and not heroic. Um, we attempt to live honestly and compassionately within the places of darkness and weariness, frustration and vulnerability. And we explore what ministry could mean within our reality. Now here I'm going to veer away from my script because I want to tell you about one of them, an Australian Anglican man, I won't give her name, in a wheelchair with MS, went shopping with a member of the religious community in their van. And when they were moving away from Waitrose to the van, um, a man approached her, stood over her, looking down on her with a great religious smile on his face and said, you do know, sister, that if you had faith in the Lord Jesus, you could stand up and walk away from that wheelchair. And we all, we all, took a deep gasp and wondered what she said. Then she told us, I looked into his face and she said, get stuffed. Such is the group. I learned through them to make the connection, which I've been very hesitant to do between our body and our sharing in the life of the body of Christ, the passion of Christ, the Paschal mystery embedded in all, all, all humanity. I also learned through them negotiating of what we call the 2 a.m. vigil. That time in the darkness when we can be at our lowest, most lonely, when our imaginations become twisted and distorted, when physical pain and soul pain overwhelm us, and when the will to carry on and on and on diminishes. I learned, and it sounds naively simple, but I haven't learned it, to offer it, to offer it towards God. It was Joe, who taught us these things, and she was born with severe cerebral palsy, communicating through a light attached to her headband, pointing at her QWERTY, qwerty board. They met on, she met John, her husband, who is a priest on the way to Tese years ago. She has two degrees from York University. Joe taught us to realign our, our way of being before God not asking God to remove us from our reality, but rather learning to offer our experience of body and soul of chaos and disorder, disorder towards God. Joe encouraged us to let God be God and to move in a mysterious way. I also learned through that little group that my body, which is so marvelously made, a miracle, the source of so much pleasure and so much pain, has become a hermitage when embraced as a place where I know that I shall meet God in the here and now of my actual humanity. I remember listening to a South African nun who carried significant worldwide 
responsibility in her religious order, traveling all over the world and also bearing much pain, physical pain and soul pain. She said, the passion of God in the world is carried not in abstract ideas, but in our human bodies and souls, in our willingness to absorb evil, suffering and shame willingly. That's the first little group of companions and we still meet, though we haven't managed since COVID started, we keep in touch. The second group of companions gathered at Sarum College in Salisbury and was situated just across the lawns from that beautiful cathedral where there's, a, remember that statue of Mary resolute walking away from the cathedral. What a statue that is. Well, we've had three weekend conferences there for between 2025 20, at the time. I think they'd just refurnished the place and got lifts so that people like us could be at home there and we were. Now, our intention was to explore the faith journey of the impaired pilgrim. And that's where I got the title for what I'm saying. All were impaired or they were the carers of impaired people. One of them, Peter, had written his MA thesis on the spirituality that emerges from impairment. He wrote of dangerous gifts challenging the traditional view of God and also the world, subversive gifts that could transform. I love that. One of the facilitators was Mary Gray, the Roman Catholic theologian. She was there helping to facilitate, but she had her own reasons to be there as well. And Mary brought with her um, a bottle of oil for anointing, not for healing, but anointing for prophetic presence in the life of the world. Now, I have never made that distinction before. Uh, so in the concluding Eucharist, all in a big circle in our wheelchairs and all kinds of conditions. We turn to each other, seeking each other's faces, each other's foreheads, the blind feeling for the face, the shaking hand steadied for the pouring out of the oil, then the murmuring of the words of commissioning each to the other. Go forth in the name of God the Father to use your gifts in the kingdom. Most of us have never been to a commissioning service such as this before or since. It was always oh, since shut us down my spine to remember it. It, it was it was beyond our preparing. It happened. This experience brought to my mind being offered the sacrament of the anointing of the oil by the other high Anglican chaplain in the hospital following my third spinal operation. And the Christian tradition from which I come, uh, this practice is unfamiliar. I've never encountered it before. But the experience of the anointing with oil and with the signing of the cross on my body, with all its dread of the future, became integral in the catharsis that I was living through. That's the second little group. And the third group of companions, well, it wasn't my idea, but rather that of our young minister who was aware of people in the congregation experience difficulty managing their physical pain and their soul pain and suggesting that we might find encouragement to occasionally meeting together. There were a couple of younger women in their mid-thirties with congenital hip conditions, older people with arthritis, two lying on bed-like chairs due to spinal conditions. And there were seven of us. And we called ourselves P87, the Pain and Hope Group. 
and there were seven of us. Each time we met, we gathered the chairs in a circle, placed a small table in the middle with a candle lit. Always, always, there was and there still is an empty chair to remind us of what Mary Gray called the absent present ones. And slowly I've learned that the absent present paradox lies layered within the whole of life and also our encounter with, with God. We shared in silence, we invited people to bring a poem, we took it in turns to tell it as it is to those who listened with a different quality of understanding. We prayed simply and briefly together and on one such gathering, our focus for the day was medication and constipation. I have a thing about bowels. There's a phrase, isn't there, in the Bible that speaks of bowels of mercy. Oh, there are times when it is so wondrous when we've had a good evacuation. <laughs> After a few years, the constitution of the group changed. People died and they showed us how it is possible to die. New people joined us, including two retired nurses with experience of palliative, palliative care. And they were a godsend. Another person was Tony, who lives with uh, an acute form of uh, respiratory condition. Um, he always wrote a poem for us and we pondered it and, and he, I want, if I've got time and uh, Fiona will tell me if I haven't got time, this is a poem that arrived this week for P87, it's called A Heart Room. This wounded heart knows well enough the arguments for despair, the opening onto emptiness, it questions, doubt trembles, but somehow also trusts a stubborn red refusal. In some deep inner chamber where I am, where guests sometimes find rest, where life and life, blood and blood, dance rhythms of hope and hurt, life's unsteady pulse is preserved from beat to beat by half heard echoes of the world's hidden heart and love flows still. I love that image of the, of the half heard echoes of the world's hidden heart. Another person who joined us was Michael. He lived with motor neurons disease. At one period, there were five people in wheelchairs our minister encouraged us to work on a service of prayer for healing and wholeness, a Eucharistic service. She herself had lived through severe cancer and treatment. And one of the things which, because ours is a big church, a big congregation where people come forward to receive the elements, but what the group wanted was that people didn't queue forward. They actually queued backwards to what is known in the congregation as Crocs Corner or Crooks Corner, where people in wheelchairs and, uh, and, um, and there waiting for them were um, Gordon, who has MS and who was a lecturer in the university, and Michael, um, both wheelchair users with um, bread on their plate on their knees. And they became the ones who looked through our eyes into our souls and prayed with us, the body of Christ keep you in eternal life. It's somehow this affirmation that we were opening ourselves to a path of, of transformation and that um, we were being drawn into the mystery of belonging to the marked rising body of Christ. 
During the two years that Michael was with us, um, he was helped to prepare some articles. And in one he wrote, our discipleship is not necessarily a journey from darkness to light, but sometimes seems to move in a complete opposite direction from the known to the unknown and from the clear to the unclear. And if I try to relate that to my own life, I have far more questions now than I did at the beginning of my faith journey. In one very real sense, I know less and less than ever before about this God who, who calls me to follow. But in another sense, the call to make the journey is as real and insistent as ever. I have to be content to let God lead me into an unknown land, even into darkness. I could tell you stories of Michael, but I think I mustn't. Another time. So I said at the beginning that I was promised when I was most isolated and most frightened, companions for the way. And that has been the case. And I will, I trust, that will be the case until the final handing over, the letting go and the untrusting into the unknown yet merciful beyond. Michael left us with a prayer and with this I will close. Lord, there is such beauty and anguish in your world. Beauty and anguish are in your heart. May we be transformed as Christ is through love and anguish. Amen. Amen, indeed. Um, I'm delighted that Donald has had a chance to join us and lead us in some of those stories of dancing the rhythms of hope and hurt, of letting God lead us in an unknown land. And I hope that today you will be finding something of Companions for the Way. I'm also delighted that Donald has been able to join us today and is with us now. Um, Donald, you are a, a precious presence indeed. Thank you so much for, for coming today and sharing some of your precious energy and time, and time away particularly. Um, I wonder, now that you are here with us for the very first time, for which we are so very happy, is there anything you'd like to say about being among in this gathering of um, 73 people um, gathered here in this meeting today? Well, first of all, I look around and I ask myself, where are the men? I'm, I'm an adopted person who searched for my birth parents and we had a, a gathering of those who were searching and they're all women. And what is it about us men <laughs> and, um, and us men in our bodies and, and, um, Oh, it's so good to see your faces, not just hear the descriptions of who you are and how you are, but to see your faces as well. And um, somebody described them as well-lived-in faces. <laughs> I like that, so I'm glad to be here, but I'll be coming and going because where, where my body needs that, and I guess your body does too. But Thank you, thank you, thank you for inviting me. And if I talk a bit too long, please forgive me. <laughs> thank you. Well, we left you a couple of minutes at the end. We we uh, we caught you a little short. So um, I I can see that in the chat, which we've been um, people have been writing their responses, and I can see there are very many people who have been deeply moved by um, your words. Uh, by the words and the stories of your companions on the journey. 
and particularly by Tony's lovely poem, which was just astonishing. Um, please do thank him for us. Um, you've very much been able to make him present. I know you were, you were worried that because of COVID and because of Zoom and because of so many difficulties um, that you, you felt you wouldn't necessarily be able to be present with your, with your companions, with your fellow pilgrims. But I'm sure that many of us have felt their presence with us today through your stories. And we would love to have a copy of Tony's poem. So I will, I will be in touch with you afterwards and, um, and sort that out. Bless you. Thank you. I'm so glad that after all these years, um, the difficulties of this pandemic have still meant that um, in the positives that you are among us and, and able to be present. So thank you. Bless you.